Okay. Thank you, Sandhya, for that lovely introduction to not only us, but uh, to Anandibai Joshi, whose life and work we will be talking about with Shikha. Um, I think I would like to invite Shikha to take us to uh, the 1800s, to 19th century Maharashtra, and give us, take us to, to that time and just introduce us to the character that you have brought out in your poems. Sure. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming. I know it's a Sunday evening and it's a long weekend, so uh, thank you all of you for coming today. And um, I, uh, I just want to say why I wrote this book briefly. Um, I live in California and I've grown up both in the West as well as the East. And I was searching for the first Indian woman who had come to the United States. So in 2017, I did an internet search and Anandi Bai's photograph just popped up in front of me and I was riveted. So the more I read about her, I became more and more fascinated, almost going down a rabbit hole. Like who is this woman who came to the United States in 1883 all by herself, alone, on a ship, and studied medicine without any family, without knowing anybody in the United States. And how she got to the States also was just as fascinating. So she was born in 1865 in Kalyan, Maharashtra, which is now part of Bombay. Um, and um, she was born into uh, you know, a, a Brahmin family, and so she was privileged in that sense. But the family had fallen in hard times, and she had other siblings. Her mother wasn't pleased when she gave birth to a daughter. So while she did grow up with love, she also grew up with a lot of adversity. And you know, she was um, in some ways neglected. Like her mother and her had a very harsh relationship. And she had smallpox when she was young. So they, and they considered her plain and dark. And they were really worried she wouldn't get married. But at the age of nine, uh, they found a widower who was willing to marry her. And the interesting thing is, he was a reformer of sorts, and he wanted to marry a widow. So the day he was supposed to marry Anandibai, he had run off looking for a widower, and he didn't show up for the wedding, and the whole family was really upset. And when he couldn't find a widow to reform, then he said, okay, you know, so she was like a consolation prize, you know, and she was like a project to him. So um, he did encourage her, but it was with a lot of force, with a lot of violence. Like he used to beat her up if she didn't study and um, her mother and other women in her family used to make fun of her, right? That why do you need to study your places in the kitchen and women never wore shoes because um, they didn't need to because they never left the home. So when she started going to school, she wore shoes, they made fun of her. So she went through a lot of struggle, but her husband did help he was a postmaster, and he did help by uh, trying to get posted in places where she could get an education. So she went from place to place. She went to Kolhapur, she went to um, uh, other cities as well, and she went to Bhuj, she went to Sarampur. So she just hopped from place to place, trying to get an education. And at that time, the missionaries had a stronghold, and so if anybody wanted to get an education in the West, they either had to convert to Christianity or somehow be involved with the church. And she refused. Her husband said, it's okay, you can convert. What difference does it make? And she said, no, I, I respect you know, Christianity, but I am who I am. So in that way, she was very strong-willed and very determined. And somehow a letter her husband had written got published in a missionary magazine, which a woman in the United States read at a dentist's office. And she read about Anandibai, and she said, I want to help this woman come to America. So she and this woman, Theodosia Carpenter, corresponded for three years. And then um, Anandibai was able to save enough money to make the passage to the United States. And she lived with this um, family, the Carpenter family. And she considered um, Theodosia as her maushi, her aunt. And so it's really incredible to see that kind of allyship in the 19th century and then um, how they helped her apply for admission to different um, colleges. And um, she taught them a lot about Indian culture as well. Like she gave her hosts and um, her daughters Hindu names. She had them all sit on the floor and eat you know, um, with their hands. She had a feast for the neighbors as well. This is all in 1883, 1884. Just imagine, right? So. 
And then she became the first Indian woman to receive a medical education in the United States and become the first female medical doctor. And um, unfortunately, because she contracted tuberculosis, uh, as soon as she graduated and went back to India, within a few months, she passed away. So it, while it was tragic, the thing is she really broke through a lot of barriers and opened the doors for future Indian women to you know, pursue an education, particularly medicine. So that's my <laughs> introduction for everybody. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Shikha. I think we are already transported back in time. Um, why didn't you also take us through some of the poems um, right from the beginning. It's sure. almost a chronological order that you yeah. write in. So if any of you do pick up this book, which I hope you do, uh, read it from beginning to end because um, it's her life, right, from birth till death. So, um, so I'm going to start with a poem called Nam Namkaran. Hmm? Naming Namkaran. I, is it really true that being named after a river is bad luck, a turbulent life. Are all women rivers then? And tell me the story again of how I came to be a paisley in your belly. Why you named me daughter of the blinding sun, sister of the Lord of death, tumbling down to earth to meet her blue beloved. How I was born the same day as a goddess riverine whose holy drops the priest sprinkled on my forehead 11 days after my birth, introducing me to this world, whispering into my ear, Yamuna, 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 a contract signed in water, a girl's fate sealed. So I just want to add that um, Anandi Bai was given the name Anandi Bai when she got married by her husband. So when she was born, she was born as uh, Yamuna Ganpat Rao Joshi. And uh, then after she got married, she became Anandi Bai Gopal Rao Joshi, or Zoshi, as they say in Marathi. Yeah. Um, to that voice that Shikha has written this poem in 2020, I wanted to just read out um, little uh, excerpts from um, 1883 about Anandi Bai Joshi. Uh, the first one is from uh, Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper. Um, it's an, an article about uh, yes. Anandi Bai Joshi and it goes, um, we give on this page a portrait of Mrs. Anandi Bai Joshi, a Brahmin lady of high social standing who has recently produced a sensation in India by breaking away from the fetters of Hindu thought and customs. Here and there, voices have been raised during the last few years in behalf of the emancipation of the sex from the tyranny of the old ideas and superstition, but no, uh, but no such pronounced action has been taken by anyone as by Mrs. Joshi, impressed by a conviction that one of the best methods of helping her sex in India would be the promotion of, uh, through med medical knowledge, she resolved to seek a medical education and on 7th April has left Calcutta for Philadelphia where she will enter the female college for a thought, thorough course of medical study. So that was it from 1883. And again, can we hear something in, in, your, in your poetic um, register? Sure, from 1883? Or? Yeah, yeah. Or we can go in chronology and maybe uh, sure, sure. something yeah. from her childhood days. Sure. Perhaps. And the thing is, she was really celebrated because they were like, this Hindu woman has come, and at the time, Orientalism was at its peak, right? And so, high caste was something that they really exalted, and that's because in, in the mind of um, the Western world, they thought it was something akin to almost being royal, which now, of course, is very troubling, but at that time, that's how society looked upon it. But she was really, really celebrated for coming from India, and they thought of her as very, very exotic, which you know I will share in some poems as well. But first, I want to show the division of men and women in her family as she was growing up, and also that she was still close to her father and not to her mother. So this poem is called A Different Kind of Arithmetic. 
Before I could count properly on my fingers, ek, don, teen, char, I learned division, the Haveli halved, into two sections, the Mardana and Zanana. A different kind of arithmetic. The louder the men spoke, the softer the women, never in the same room next to each other, unless an auspicious occasion. Children were the exception of which I was one, running freely between both, a threat to no one. Like a sun, I consumed rice with extra ghee, tumbling with my brothers, who teasingly called me Malla after I defeated them repeatedly. I was strong and proud like our fabled ancestors who served in courts and wars, whose accounts lay preserved in scrolls. One whom I met in a dream, a valiant soldier who promised great things were sure to come. I tried to beat it out of me, this unladylikeness, this streak of obstinacy. But Baba Sahib treated me as one of the boys, indulging my dreams and foibles, his eyes crinkling when I ran to him each evening under the shade of a giant people tree, sitting on his lap unloading the day's thoughts, my fears and world queries, asking him the difference between my dolls and idols of gods, why both lay mute in one's hands at the mercy of others' inclinations. Oh, thank you. So I just wanted to say that what I've written, this incident of her going up to her father and asking her, him, the difference between her dolls and idols of gods, this is all true. So she was very smart and astute from the beginning. But if you read different biographies of hers, they never show that aspect. They always show her as it's her husband who, you know, um, helped her and pushed her. But, you know, she had the aptitude, she had the intelligence, and um, she, from the beginning, questioned things, you know, that why is this like this and why is this not like this? So I think she really deserves credit for being a strong willed, confident uh, girl and woman who, you know, thought very independently for that time, age, for that time, you know? And, and take us through the backstage of your thinking. How do you do your research as a poet and not purely as a historian? And how did you pick up which, you know, events could be then yeah. drawn into entire poems or even a sequence of poems? How did you begin and what was that process like? So actually that was very, very difficult because I love doing research and I became so obsessed with collecting facts that I was like, how do I translate a life? It's also very intimidating. Um, and because she lived a short life, I was able to put it down. But if she had led a very long one, it would have been much more challenging. But even so, uh, I realized that nobody's life is static. There are ups and downs, and you know, there are good things that happen and bad things that happen. And so, how does one convey that through poetry besides words, right? So I've actually, um, use different forms of poetry. I have concrete poetry. I have poetry that is um, formal verse as well. Like I have pantoums and I have um, sonnets and um, I have some other uh, forms. One is called a duplex. So I, I thought that because life has its variations, the poetry also had to have variations. And one of the other challenges I had was is that I'm writing in the voice of a 19th century woman. I can't write casually. I can't write in the way that we talk right now, right? So I had to do a lot of research about the time period. And um, luckily, there was access to Anandi Bai's letters. And you know, she was quite dramatic in the way she wrote things. And I think in that day and age, you know, it was drama combined with a certain formal, formalism or formality. There was a lot of politeness as well. So I had to keep all of those things in mind. But um, I know this might sound crazy. Every time I'd set out to write a poem, I would look up and I'd say, Anandi Bai, what do you want me to write? So I sort of invited her to guide me and help me. And you know, the muse is a funny thing. It's, it's a very numinous thing. I can't really describe how a writer actually comes to write things. I really do feel there's a certain energy that gets channeled. And I'm not saying Anandi Bai wrote this book, but she certainly helped me write this book. <laughs> 
Yeah, I want to stay on that subject a bit more. So what Shikha has also done so beautifully is it, it's not just a woman's life from the 19th century, it's also a woman's life through the ages. And you know, the register you've used from the first poems to when she uh, learns English and then when she goes to America and uh, the marriage uh, before that, they all have a slight difference to it. It's also a voice that's evolving through the yeah. life. So tell us about how you um, sort of limited your own language to, uh, you've also used some Marathi in it. There's, there's also, as you were saying, there's a lot of formality and politeness. So there's a, the colonial English, the flavor of that. And she was very learned. She loved reading. She did. Yeah. yeah. So tell us how you sort of created the register, the tone, the mood. Well, I, I tried to inhabit her life and think, you know, when you're young, what are the things you observe? And then as you get older, um, you know, um, what are the things you observe? But also, as I read about Anandi Bai, I knew she was very conscious of everyone around, around her, whether it was her mother, whether it was her husband, um, whether it was her father. And she didn't want to upset anybody. You know, she wanted to try and keep everyone happy. Which is a struggle I think, you know, uh, the Indian woman faces even now. And that's something I actually really connected with. But, but you know, I, um, by reading as much as I could about her, by looking at her letters, by looking at the conversations she had and what others said about her, you know, that really helped me in finding her voice, you know. And um, it, it, it evolved, through, you know, in that way. But also... Because she was so traditional in many ways, like she was proud of the background she came from, right? I wanted to show that in the poems as well. And, you know, I, that's why I've interspersed it with Marathi, uh, wherever I could. But also the, the slipping of the Marathi, because when she went to the United States, she was all alone and she was speaking all um, English all the time. And she was young, she was only 19. So she actually says that, in, in one of her letters that she's fallen out of the habit of speaking Marathi and her Marathi became very, very rusty in the, in the couple of years that she was actually there, you know? And so when her husband finally came for a graduation, like he pointed that out and he was very upset with her, even though he was the one who said, you know, change and adjust as you need to. If you have to eat meat, eat meat. If you have to speak in English, speak English. If you have to change your dress, change your dress. And she said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. But when she actually did very minor changes, he got very upset at her. So, you know, I had to keep all of these things in mind, not just what she's feeling, but what others felt in response to what she was doing, what her behavior was. So. It, I don't, honestly, I don't know how I did it. it. It somehow just all came together. It's the muse. Yeah. But um, it was tying different threads together. And while it was challenging, it was also like a puzzle. And it was a puzzle I wanted to try and solve. So um, that's why I have to say I loved writing this book. It, it was, out of all the things I've written, I have to say this has been one of the most thrilling things I have done. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. <laughs> but I'm going to probe more on your writing process. I've also been very curious because the poems in the book appear chronologically. Yes. You know, birth and then before birth almost like a prayer and then her naming and her, a yeah. few poems to do with childhood and the whole how she got married, who she got married to, then her travels and all. So did you write the poems in sequence or? No. no. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, some of them I did. Because what happened is, at first, I had written, so before I'd even started this project, I was trying to write poetry about um, the history of Indians in the United States. So I'd written a poem in third person about Anandi Bai. Never thought I'd write a book about her, honestly. I tried not to write this book because I questioned myself as whether I was the right person to do so. But then Anandi Bai didn't let go of me. So, um, so wait, what was the question? The sequence, oh, as the opposed sequence. to say yeah, maybe right, writing right. a novel. Yeah. So, um, so then I I started off. I mean, I didn't like the first poem. Nam Karan was not the first poem I wrote. In fact, I don't remember what the first poem was. But as I had shared before, I would like look up to the sky and say, Anandi Bai, what do you want me to write? So you know, whatever occurred that okay, I'll write about this. I sort of did that for like the first 
uh, 10, 15 poems or so. But then once I had like a few poems, then like a skeleton of uh, the narrative started to emerge. And then I said, okay, now before I confuse myself any further, now I should start doing things chronologically and start filling gaps. So like you sort of have some anchor poems. So like, you know, her birth, then when she got married, then when she went to America, so, and then her death, which when she fell ill and died, those I actually wrote towards the end. And the last poem is the last poem I wrote. But um, yeah, so I had like some anchor poems. And then after that, it was about filling in the gaps as much as I could. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting <laughs> to know. Um, so we've reached, with the poetry, we've reached to her childhood days. Right. And um, as you have mentioned before and also in your introduction, her marriage seems to be sort of the lens that her life is often seen through in the mm. narratives that were available before. But you're trying to completely turn that around and see it from her perspective. So right, shall we right. hear a few poems from the marriage? Definitely, definitely. So um, here, one of the poems which I will share... Um, it's so if there are people here who speak Marathi, please forgive me. <laughs> I'll do my very best to pronounce everything correctly. Um, so this poem is called Lagnachi Bedi, which is a suitable match. And um, when Anandi Bai had been corresponding with Theodosia Carpenter, one of the things she had written, now imagine this is a girl who is 16, 17, right? She wrote this sentence which just blew me away because girls were married so young. And so she wrote to Theodosia, we marry before we know what it is for. Just imagine this young girl is, uh, had written this. So this is a poem about her, her marriage being arranged. 1874. Bhatji the priest shows up with scrolls in his satchel, patrikas of prospective grooms. I am never in the room when they do the gunamilan. And how powerful the moon that determines our alliance, Ashtakut, eight aspects to see if we match or cross. The stars align, you are 26 and I, not quite nine. No misfortune upon you, though you are widowed, never stripped of color, nor sequestered to a harsh life. For it is your good fortune to be born a man. My sobhagya to be a postmaster's second wife, moving place to place like a mail letter, gathering the stamp of bin shahere. And how lucky I am you have no demands, no money, no gold, only the promise to teach me, to make me wise. And when we first meet, you ask my name. To gauge my ability, hear my voice, as I stare at my toes, a downward gaze passed through centuries when suddenly I lift my head, peer straight into your eyes and reply, Maze nao yamuna ganpati joshi, ganpatrao joshi ahe. So she, you know, I'm trying to show how confident she was even then. So even though he's come to see her and she's like this, she looked up at him and said, and I don't know if this is true, this is my own imagination. I've taken the creative liberty here to say that she looked at him and answered what her name was, you know? Yeah. And, and while doing your research about her, were, there, were you surprised by any of the findings about their relationship? Like the, how you portray is it's quite complicated. It's much, there's like a lot of shades than yeah, say the yeah. straightforward biography might offer or a straight right. article might. So actually there are a lot of things that were like, for example, in one biography I read that Gopal Rao, her husband, was hired as her tutor to teach her. In another one, I read something different. Um, and then the movie, there was a movie that came out, uh, Anandi Gopal, um, a couple of years ago, which was in Marathi. Um, that sh showed something totally different than what I'd read. So there's so many different versions that existed. And um, I know there's also a Doordarshan serial on Anandi, Anandi Bai as well, which showed a little bit of his mercurial nature. But um, most biographies and novels did not mention this, the ones that were written in the 30s and you know 40s and the play and stuff like that. So when I started reading her letters and this biography that was by an American feminist named Caroline Healy Dahl, they all alluded to how um, you know, Anandi Bai Joshi was very happy in the United States because her husband wasn't there, because other family members weren't there. And that was the first time 
she discovered who she was as a person, you know? Um, so it, it was really fascinating to me to see that empowerment which came because there was no critical eye, you know, to tell her what she should be doing and what she shouldn't be doing. But her husband did have, uh, she and her husband had a very complicated um, relationship. And what version, there's a letter that she wrote to her husband when she was in the United States and he was in India. And she said, you know, the way you treated me was not right. You know, the, this is, I was a child and this is not the way you treat a child, you know. And apparently like he, when she wasn't studying once, she, he hit her with a stick and it was so bad that her, her skin became swollen and they had to cut her blouse. They had to rip it because they could not take it off because her skin had swollen so badly. So she went through a lot of hardships in many ways, even though she was born into privilege, you know, yeah. But yeah, it was a volatile relationship. And while I think he was very proud of her, he was also jealous of her because he himself wanted to go to the United States. He himself wanted to be regarded as a learned man. And so he was in some ways vicariously living through her, but he also wanted the credit, yeah. And you've softened some of these angles with, uh, with poetry, so shall we? Here, one of one of those poems. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say I softened it. But I, I, it's there, but because I wanted to focus on her and her narrative, I, I did in some ways downplay him. Yeah. So let me let's see which poem. Um, okay, so this is a concrete poem, and let me show you all. I don't know if you can see this, but it's in the shape of a sickle. And um, this poem is called Consumption for two reasons, because we consume knowledge, but also because she died of tuberculosis, which, is, which was also back in the day known as consumption. So um, I will read this poem. Consumption. His tongue is a sickle. When the words come out, they cut me like a handful of grass uprooting me from where I stand. Dullard, lazy, incompetent, adjectives he swings at me again and again. But if this were truly so, he would impress me between jaws of books, the ink of alphabets seeping into my skin, staining my blood, this knowledge that consumes me as I consume it. He wouldn't hurl their hard spines at me if he thought I couldn't catch them. Um, can we now talk about the visual aspect of the book? Sure. Yes, because it, from your introduction, I can tell that you were also very captured by the photograph um, yes, of Anandibai yes. Joshi that you found while doing your research. So talk us through about how visually you think also as a researcher, historian, poet, and how her photographs affected maybe your, the forms of the poems, how they look on the page? Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so I am a very visual writer. I've always been really big on imagery. But here I was also telling a life story, so I had to sort of control myself a little bit in terms of you know, focusing on imagery because here the story, the narrative, and her voice were the two most important things. But um, the reason why I was drawn to her, it all began with a photograph. And um, I urge you all to look up this photograph if you can. This is a photograph that was taken at a medical school reception. And there are three doctors in this photograph. So Anandibai is sitting on, um, well, when I, when I look at the picture, right, it's the left side. And she's wearing a sari and she's seated like this. And she has a Mona Lisa-like glance, like she's like this. And I swear, you look at that photograph, no matter which angle you look at it, she's looking at you. And then next to her is a Japanese uh, doctor wearing a kimono and looking very you know, sophisticated and dainty. And then next to her is a Syrian woman doctor who is dressed in her uh, you know, Syrian um, out, national outfit, holding, I think it's a lyre or something like that, some sort of harp-like instrument. So this photograph, which was taken, I think it was 1884, um, it, 
just to imagine such a photograph uh, we'd taken back in the day, these three doctors who converged in Philadelphia, the energy in that photograph just blew me away. And at first I thought, oh, I wish I could write about all three of them. But there wasn't enough information and then I really wanted to focus on Anandibai. But that picture was what got me started. And then I wanted to write a poem on that picture. And for some reason, that was the most difficult poem for me to write in this book. I don't know why, because each time I wanted to write it, the voice wouldn't come out correctly. And the thing about that photograph is, um, as I'd mentioned before, at that time in the Western world, Orientalism was at its height. And the, picture, the person who took that picture was a white man, somebody from the uh, medical college. And they probably told them how to sit and you know, to wear your best you know, native outfits. And don't, you know, they didn't smile back in the day. So I was just wondering, how did these women feel? What did they think? You know, here we are you know, in this country, you know, all exotified for them. And all the people who will see this photograph will probably be white people. So, it, it was very difficult for me to write this because I didn't want to put my biases in it, right? I wanted it to somehow be from Anandibai. But in the end, I had to take up a form, which is a new form of poetry invented by an American poet. Um, um, what's his name? Uh, I, I forget his name, but it'll come back to me. But he invented his, this um, form called the duplex. So the poem is in couplets. But there's space between it. There's a lot of white space. So that it gives this poem more power and strength. So um, it, I, when I finally took up a formal you know, way of writing it, it came out. Um, because you know, sometimes, most of the time, I guess, you know, poets like to write in free verse, and you know, they, they feel they have more freedom. But I actually found freedom in formal verse, which I used to hate formal verse. But it, it's sort of like a picture frame in many ways. So delving into formal verse when necessary has really helped me focus on the message. So I can share that poem. Yeah, let me just find it for you. Let me see. Um, OK, I cannot show what page is it. I've marked so many poems here that. <laughs> Yeah. 79. Huh? 79. Oh, thank you. All right. So this poem, and I gave it a long title intentionally. When they ask us to pose for a photograph at the Women's Medical College reception, Philadelphia, 1885. Forgive us if we don't smile. The ocean scent still on our clothes, still on our clothes, the stench of sea. We visitors of another clime, of warmer lands are we. With pride we wear our native clothes, silks and jewels we proudly don. Sari, kimono, headdress of coins, with lyre, sash, a handheld fan. No scalpel, stethoscope, or degree. Three female doctors of foreign pedigree playing dress up for Western eyes. In our appearance, they see worlds wild. Forgive us if we don't smile. Thank you. So I wanted to say that the more I studied that picture, the more I wondered. Why are, why are they holding, like the Japanese um, doctor was holding a fan, and the, the Syrian doctor was holding a lyre. Um, why didn't they have anything that had to do with medicine in their hands, right? So then the more you look at the picture, then you realize that you know, there, there are a lot of different things going, and that that picture is telling us so much about the times, as well as the position of the women. So I'm really glad that I took the time to figure out the right way to write about that photograph. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I th yeah, there's a lot going on with the gaze of the poem. And exactly. To just give you some more taste of the time, the 1883, the gaze from the Western side. Um, this is a diary entry of Mrs. Caroline Healy-Doll, who is one of the biographers that you've yes. uh, 
consulted with while writing the book. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, from 1883. Um, I think this is when she has just met Anandibai. After she yeah, met Anandibai. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this is her entry about Anandibai. Uh, she looks like a stout, dumpy, mulatto girl, not especially interesting, until her yellow face lights up. And light up it did as soon as she gathered from a helping word of mine that I was familiar with the customs of her people. I cannot describe the effect. It was magical. She speaks seven languages of which English, Sanskrit, and Maratha are three. Her English is exquisite. There is hardly a flaw in pronunciation or construction. If I had not known, I should have thought her born in this country. <laughs> and I think this is something that will, that must have resonated with you growing up in the US and the UK. Absolutely. I mean, in that comment, I mean, I think Caroline Healy Dahl thought she was paying Anandi by a compliment, but she called her a dumpy, stout mulatto, and then said her yellow face, you know, lit up. You know, I mean, if you look at it now, obviously it's very racist, but even then, even then, I mean, I mean, she's not paying any compliments. She's like, once I mention how I, so Caroline Healy Dahl had gone to India a few times and um, had visited, and so she's saying, when I mention India, then Anandibai's face lit up, you know? So she's also giving herself credit for being a cultured woman. So there's so many things, but Caroline Healy Dahl did one really wonderful thing, that as soon as Anandibai passed away, she immediately started writing Anandibai's biography. She was actually really moved by Anandibai. And she talked to Anandibai's husband, and um, you know, she also talked to other people that Anandibai knew, and gathered facts and wrote this biography. So um, although it was tinted with a Western gaze, but it still had a lot of factual information about Anandibai. But coming to how I connect to that, so. I was born in England and I grew up partially in the United States. And when I was young, um, because I spoke English flawlessly, it was my first language, everyone would say, oh wow, you speak great English. And then you know, they'd say, oh, you know, it's flawless. How, how do you speak such good English? You know? And I was shocked when I read this because I was thinking, oh my god, Anandibai faced this in 1883. I faced this in 1983, you know? And um, even now people say such things, right? So that was one of the many things I resonated with. But, and I also went through quite a bit of racism when I grew up in the 80s. So um, there was a lot I could connect to, you know, in, in terms of her story. Um, but yeah, that's one of the many things. <laughs> I wanted to also ask you about the two biographies that you mentioned that yes. kind of connect your work, which, which is also a biography in yes. verse. You have uh, Caroline Healy Dahl's book that was written shortly after Anandi Bai Joshi's that in, I think it was published in 1888? I think it might have been 1880, let's see, when did Anandi Bai die? 1887, right? Okay. Yeah, so 1888, yeah, right. I think you're and, right. And then, then you also mentioned Meera Kosambi's work uh, yes. from yes. the 2020? So oh. Meera Kosambi's book was published posthumously, sadly, right. although she'd done some work yes. which got published yeah. earlier, but I think Meera Kosambi's book came out in, I want to say 2020, mm -hmm. or something like that, 2019, 2020. Yeah, and so like these that. were two very different um, women writing about Anandi Bai Joshi from a very, very different times and right, lens right. and, and as, as, a, as an Indian, also you identify as an Indian poet in America, so how, right. does, how, do, how did the politics of all of that help you in writing the poem or did, it, did you face challenges or? No, I think they both really did help me. Of course, one book was written by a, a white I mean, a Western, um, white Western woman from the 19th century. And then this other book was written uh, by a scholar in the 21st century. So, and then in between I'd read biographies. There's um, some translations, um, I think, uh, was it G? I can't remember his name. I think it's, I've mentioned it in the back of the book though. Um, G.V. Joshi, I, or some, some name uh, like that. Um, he had written a book which was translated, um, and a novel on Anandibai, so I read that as well. But the two interesting things that I got was, so I got, from, from Caroline Healy Dahl's perspective, I got a lot of details about what life was like back then, and the things Anandibai said when she met Westerners, right? And um, there were a lot of details about how she looked, what she was wearing, some of the things, um, facts, for example. At that time, as I said, Orientalism was at its height, and Barnum Bailey Circus, 
the American circus, they had a lot of um, you know crazy exhibits, as they call them, um, where they had um, you know jugglers and clowns and elephants, and um, they imported like. Um, the, African people, just because of the way they look, tribal people, and like, you know, Indian um, sword swallowers, things like that, right? Um, so, um, what, what was I talking about again? Sorry, I get lost in the this biographies. Book. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, um, Caroline Healy Dahl mentioned that Anandi Bai went to Barnum Bailey Circus, but didn't care, care for it. She didn't like it at all. So small, small details like that. Okay, why didn't Anandi Bai care about it? I started thinking about it, and I thought she must have been offended. She must have been offended to see a mockery of her culture in other cultures, you know? So small, small details like that. Also, Anandi Bai went to Tiffany and um, Company, the jewelers, and that they were very impressed with her because she was wearing very different jewelry from what they carried, right? So all those small details I got from Caroline um, Healy Dahl's book, and then from Mira Kos Sambi's book, I got insight into Anandi Bai's relationship with Gopal Rao because um, you know she was looking at that um, you know at Anandi Bai's, Anandi Bai's life from a um, you know Indian feminist women's perspective. So I got both those perspectives, which was wonderful. And then I sort of had to weave the in between, you know, um, and. You know, the, the, there were two different voices, both of them talking about Anandi Bai, but I was still questioning where is Anandi Bai's voice in this? You know, and so that's why I thought I'll write it in the first person. And I was very nervous about it because I thought, you know, what will people think? You know, she has the audacity to write about somebody else's life in the first person. But I couldn't think of a better way to give her power back to her, to give her story back to her, to have her somehow be the one who is narrating it, even though it's from my imagination. But I try to put in as many facts and as many words of hers as possible in it. So. Yeah, I also wanted to ask you about that. I mean, poetry is al always, I think, an alchemy of fact and fiction absolutely, and imagination. Absolutely. And But you have used almost as a very... Um, very uh, thoughtful technique, her own words from letters, you have lines of her, uh, lines from her letters, and, and there's that fascinating found poem um, yes, that yes, you have yeah. collected from the, the autograph book that she had yes, um, she filled signed. out. Yeah. yeah, if you could tell us a bit about um, how you interweaved her words into your mm -hmm. poems and what that takes to do? Like, what techniques did you use to do that? Yeah, so found poetry is very interesting, um, where you take words that are already there, and um, you, you use it for a different purpose. Uh, but in this case, her words, they're just, I mean, when you read this, this is a diary entry which she had written in Theodosia Carpenter's house. You know how back in the day when we were kids, we'd have autograph books and ask our friends to sign and say, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite flower? And I just imagined that probably nobody had asked Anandi Bai any of this because women were not thought important enough to ask their opinions, right? So she is in America. And her hostess, her, her you know, adopted aunt, her Maushi, has said, hey, why don't you write down all these things about yourself? What's your favorite color? And maybe this gave her a chance to think about herself. And what was so remarkable, as I was reading this, right, one of the things, one of the questions was, who would you like to be if not yourself? And her, you know what her answer was? No one. <laughs> showed me how much inner strength she had, you know? So that blew me away. And so I had to have that in the book. And so I have the whole, the, all the questions she answered. I have the entirety of that. But I've offered a little introduction before I put that, you know? So, I mean, I can read that. Oh, yeah, that would be lovely. Okay, let me find that. You're better at finding my poems than I am. Ah, here it is. <laughs> I found it. So it's called, at the time they called that a mental photograph. That's what they called it. A found poem from Anandi by Joshi's entry in Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter's autograph book. 
September 3rd, 1883. So this is the part I written. I was ravenous, shoving the open mouth of my mind with morsels of knowledge held by my husband's hand, that after crossing two oceans when I should be asked in the parlor of my sponsor, a kind American woman whom I call Maushi, mother's sister in my native tongue, but whose love is like a mother's itself, what my favorite things are, I am truly overcome with joy. No one has ever asked this of me, not even I. And so I write in the album of Mrs. Theodosia Carpenter of Roselle, New Jersey, ever so carefully, answers that introduce me to myself. <laughs> and so it's, here, here are the things. So these are all favorites, right? Color, white. Flower, the rose. Tree, the mango. Object in nature, mountains. Hour, sun, sunrise and set. Season, spring. Perfume, jasmine. Gem, diamond. Style of beauty, perfection of form and manner. Name, male and female. Rama, Tara, Annie, Gopal, Vishnu, and Krishna. Painter, I love all. Musician, those who play on the violin and lyre. Piece of architecture, the Taj Mahal. Poet, Pope, Manu, and Kalidasa. Poetess, Muktabai and Janabai. Prose author, Goldsmith, Macaulay, Addison, and um, this Marathi writer called Shastri Chiplunkar. Character in history, Richard the Lion, or as it's written here, Richard, okay, my French is bad, Coire de Lyon? <laughs> I don't know. Book to take up for an hour, the Bhagavad Gita. What book, not a Bible, would you part with last? the history of the world. What epoch would you prefer to live in? The present. Where would you prefer to live? In Roselle now, hereafter in heaven. What is your favorite amusement? Reading. What is your favorite occupation? Whatever is necessary to the common comfort. What is your favorite trait of character? Sincerity. What trait do you most detest? Dishonesty and infidelity. If not yourself, whom would you like to be? No one. What is your idea of happiness? Faith in God. What is your idea of misery? To follow one's own win. What is your bete noir? Slavery and dependence. What is your ideal pleasure? To be rewarded for what I do. What is your distinguishing, distinguishing characteristic? I have not yet found out. <laughs> that of your husband, benevolence. What is the sublimest passion? Love. What are the sweetest words? Love, charity, truth, and hope. What are the saddest? Lost, forsaken. What is your aim? To be useful. What is your motto? The Lord will provide. So. So I just want to say, this was all in Caroline Healy Doll's book. So that book was invaluable in so many ways, you know, which you would not find in any other biography of her. Yeah. And th this little um, entry, the, the whole book is so incredible just to get a glimpse into a very young girl's mind. Exactly, exactly. And she was very young when she went to America and when she studied there. And you've talked a bit uh, about how she was also, um, it was a challenge for her to let go of all her traditional knowledge yes, and yes. Um, her traditions and her language. She knew seven languages. Right, right, um, right. And how she had to adapt to a new culture and a new city, although she did fall in love with the place that she was living in. And you have written poems in various forms. Um, right, right. So could you read us something from uh, her days in America? Sure, definitely. Um, so I want to add that some interesting things about her life was, she went to the city of Roselle, which was the first city to be electrified in the United States. And that happened only a few months before she arrived. So Roselle was special for that reason. And then because a Maratha woman from India came 
um, and she, you know she was the first Indian woman to come to study medicine. So Rizal had some interesting things happening at that time, right? Um, so. When Anandibai came, like she initially stayed in a hostel, but she was so miserable because she couldn't cook her own food and she only wanted to eat Indian food. So, um, you know, she was trying to cook rice in between classes and dal and stuff. And, um, you know, once her room filled up with smoke and it was so bad that then the dean of the medical college said, you can come and live in my house. So that's when things started improving for her. And also getting up, going to class, you know, and being on time everywhere. Like it was a little challenging for her. And so um, Theodosia Carpenter's husband gave her an alarm clock. And she'd never seen an alarm clock before. So that also helped her, you know, uh, you know, you know, get to places on time. So let me see if I can find those poems. Um, yeah. But before that, actually, there's one poem I would love to share. So there was a huge reception for her in which like 500 people had showed up because they wanted to meet this Indian woman who wanted to study medicine. And um, you know, they were all really fascinated by her appearance especially. And also though, because she was from India, I don't know whether the notion was that, you know, she's exotic, she might have germs or something. So when she shook hands with everyone, she wore gloves. And I'm not sure why that is or whether it was part of the tradition at that time, but I found it really fascinating. So, and they called her Lady of the Orient. So this poem is called, They Call Me Lady of the Orient. Philadelphia, September 1883. Though the darkest one in the room, I'm the brightest of them all in a red pitambar sari, dim Pompeian bell of this ball. And as I shake their hands, 500 pairs wearing gloves to protect me. They regard the spray of pearls hanging from my nose, my filigreed wrists of bangles glinting gold, the tiny kunku dot on my broad forehead drawing stares and praise. For this young Hindu lady so brave, having come all the way alone from Serampore to the city of brotherly love to earn her doctor's coat. Maze now, anandi ahe, I want to say, in my native tongue, so that I don't forget who I am, the young girl whose books once lay tattered in the cowshed, whose baby lived barely ten days. I float like an Indian rose among a dull sea of cinched waists and bonnets in the parlor of the dean of the women's medical college, smiling till my cheeks hurt as they stumble out a new version of my name, Ananda Bai, remarking how exquisite is my English. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, the, Again, all of these details were in Caroline Healy Doll's book. Yeah, but what was the poem that we were uh, you were asking me to share? <laughs> I have any, any of the ones of medical college, yeah. right? That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, just one second. I wanted to share that because that's you know, you know, th that's sort of a glimpse of how they regarded her and how she regarded them, and. They called her Ananda Bai throughout, even in this biography by Caroline Healy Doll. It was, again, Ananda Bai. I don't know why they couldn't say Anandi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, where am I? Okay, so here's an interesting poem. And it's called Bracelet of Gold. Um, and this sort of shows Anandi's mind, right? Um, how she was very practical in her thinking. Bracelet of Gold, Philadelphia, 1886. Some would say this is a bad omen, Buri Nazar, penance for crossing waters dark as coal, to live alone among people white as snow. Still unused to these harsh northeast winters, I miss the patch of ice that shines like a mirror, and my right hand lands first to brace the fall. Though no bones are broken, all my bangles shatter in the manner of a Hindu widow, bits of green glass pressing into my skin, drawing out the red. When my husband finds my wrist unadorned, lacking any ornamentation, he slides into place a bracelet of gold, cold like the touch of his fingers. And if every fall would bring as much gold, would you consider it a misfortune? Mm -hmm. 
I call it so, wishing instead an instrument more useful or a book more instructive. So those last lines are hers. That, that, that she, she really didn't want the gold bangles. She wanted surgical tools. She wanted medical books instead. And well, uh, let me read um, a pantoum. Um, so um, I don't know if all of you know this, but um, the reason why Anandibai decided to become a doctor was um, she had given birth to a son and he only survived for 10 days. And one of the reasons that might have been was because women were very hesitant to go to the doctor because doctors were mostly white and European at the time. So um, she, she thought, if I couldn't save my son, at least let me try and help you know, the women of my country and save other people's children, right? So this is a poem called Dissection, a pantoum. And I want to add that, so um, this was in one of the biographies that when um, the women medical, women medical students were asked to dissect, many of them couldn't do it. And it, it, there was one of an infant. But Anandi Bai did. She, she, for some reason, she was resolute. She wasn't scared. She was one of the only people who um, remained in the operating room while all the other uh, students ran away. So this poem is called Dissection, a Pantoum. And this is 1884. Were it not an infant, how much easier it would be, only two of us in the room, the others having turned away, that hours ago he might have suckled at her breast, how still the dissection table under our studious gaze. Only two of us in the room, the others having turned away, a pale boy with wisps of blonde hair, curled fists, blue lips, how still the dissection table under our studious gaze, aborted or succumbed to illness, is what we must ascertain. A pale boy with wisps of blonde hair, curled fists, blue lips, unlike my own, dark, with a thick shock of hair, aborted or succumbed to illness, is what we must ascertain. I am surprised when my hand glides, how it doesn't shake. Unlike my own, dark, with a thick shock of hair, his loss accepted without inquiry or investigation. I am surprised when my hand glides, how it doesn't shake, making a vertical incision from the skin before backward. His loss accepted without inquiry or investigation. I have not traveled this far to let history repeat itself, making a vertical incision from the skin before backward. I search for the answers I myself did not get. I have not traveled this far to let history repeat itself. Were it not an infant, how much easier it would be. I search for the answers I myself did not get, that hours ago he might have suckled at her breast. The form of the pantoum, the repetition is almost as precise as you'll have to get with the instruments. It's, yeah. it's fascinating that you've chosen that form for this form. H how did you decide which forms for which of her parts of life? Um, what, were, what was that process like? Well, it was very intuitive. And in this case, you know, um, when I read about this incident, it's very hard, to, you know, how do you write about um, loss? How do you, r just imagine she'd lost her own child and here was a dead baby in front of her and she didn't flinch, you know? So what must she have been thinking? And at the same time, when you think of a child, you think of lullabies, right? So I somehow wanted to evoke that rhythm in the poem and, and, and make this, st this stark subject a little softer. So that's why I thought the pantoum would be a good, um, you know, a yeah. good, good form for this. That's, that's very fascinating to know. Um, I think we're good. We can maybe open uh, the floor to questions, if you have questions for Shikha. How old was she when she passed away? She was 21. 21, yeah. And she had got her degree by that time? She did, because at that time, a medical degree was only um, for three years. So, um, yeah, she... she Went there, you know, I think, I believe at the age of 18, she um, finished her degree at the age of 21, and then she came back to India, and just a month shy of turning 22, she passed away, yeah. Yes? So I was curious, when you're doing uh, research 
to her life. Was this generally the experience of uh, Indian students at that time who uh, went to America, where they were feted during the time of Orientalism? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think there had been a lot of men that had come before, and um, I think men adapted in terms of dress more easily and um, the customs more easily. Although there were some people like um, Anandi Bai's husband, he gave a series of lectures on Indian culture and he wore his turban and things like that. And he was ridiculed because he was um, talking about how horrible Western culture is and how um, great Hinduism and Indian culture is. But um, in her case, you know, I actually don't know. I mean, uh, she, she was the first, definitely one of the first Indian women to come. And after that, the women did come were performers. And so um, they did continue to get, um, you know, exoticized because I believe after Anandi Bai, it was notch dancers who had come to uh, New York City and things like that. And, you know, they, they, they were, um, you know, there was a certain expectation. In fact, the interesting thing about researching the this book was I came up uh, across the stories of you know circus performers and notch dancers and things like that and um, you know they were exoticized to the extent that when um, American men came to see such performers they were very disappointed because they were clothed from you know top to bottom and their dance was you know much slower than they expected so you know I learned things like that and you know I, I, I thought oh I'd love to write about this someday as well but yeah I don't I mean I'm, I'm not a historian so I can't really tell you like you know in detail about these things but I think it was a while before you know um, in, in Indian uh, people were um, respected for who they were. In fact, the, the, um, I, the, another fact I discovered while researching this book is that the so-called mother of Indian modern dance stole moves from the Indian notch dancers and she herself would dress up and pretend to be Radha and things like this. So they also took a lot from Indian culture and the roots of American modern dance are in Indian dance, believe it or not. So. Um, they did co-opt a lot of the looks and the clothes, and then um, the ship jumpers, who were known as uh, Luskers, right? They also, um, you know, were peddling wares in North Carolina along the East Coast during that time, but all after Anandi Bai. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for a long time, I think it's safe to say that, you know, they were looked at with fascination, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Um, if Anandi Bai were alive today, then how do you think she would have like responded to the poems that you've written? Ooh. <laughs> you know, I hope she would like it because I asked her. I, I asked her each time I wrote a poem. So my hope is, I cannot say for sure, I cannot say for certain, but my hope is she would have said you did a good job. Maybe you could have here and there, you know, written this or that. But I think she would have approved. I, I, I think she would have. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, I just want to add one more thing yes. to close this. So, you know, Anandi Bai knew she was dying in a way, I think, but she was still very hopeful she would get better and she was awarded, um, it, she was like, um, there was um, a hospital in Kolhapur and she was given the whole women's ward and, um, you know, she was really hoping she would teach and she wanted to teach, um, you know, uh, the, those who were poor for free and stuff like that. But um, when she knew she was dying, she was on her deathbed, she had a very special request that once she was cremated, her ashes be sent back to Theodosia Carpenter and her family. And so her husband, who was you know very religious and everything, still honored her wishes. And so her ashes were sent back to the United States and they were buried in um, a rural New York in Poughkeepsie with the Amy Carpenter family, um, you know, in, in the Poughkeepsie Cemetery. So her ashes still, her ashes are in America and she has a gravestone and the gravestone has her spelling as Ananda Bai, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, the, I just wanted to share that it says, her gravestone reads, Ananda Bai Joshi, M.D., 1865 to 1887, first Brahmin woman to leave India to obtain an education. So 
When I found that out, that also blew my mind that there's a headstone that her ashes rest in America. So when she said that she wanted to be in Rizal, you know, New Jersey, and afterwards heaven, I, I guess that sort of happened. <laughs> There's a question. Yes, yes. please. Uh, good evening. Uh, it, uh, maybe it seems like a, uh, it sounds like a generalist question that uh, how uh, patriarchal hegemony's attitude towards uh, Anandabai could you please just explain a little bit? Sure. Um, well, I mean that's a longer question, but I will tell you this: when Anandabai, so she was really criticized as she was going um, to the United States. In fact, in the College of Serampore, she had to give this whole speech of why I want to go to America. And when she returned, all the newspapers said that her husband's purpose of sending her to America has been fulfilled. <laughs> so. I don't know if that answers your question, but even after she returned, even after she studied and became a doctor and returned to India, people congratulated her, but they gave the credit to her husband. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we end with one last poem? Uh, sure, and I think the poem that I will read is the last poem, and it's called The End. February 26th, 1887. I have done all that I could, so much surmounted, but for death. And I go surrounded by love, my obligations shed. Consumed by fire, ashes return to earth. I leave you with embers to fan as you wish. Oh mother, oh mother, oh mother. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank and you. Thank you, BIC, for this wonderful opportunity. <laughs> thank you. Sir.